Well, hello. Welcome to our Grad Research Methods Design level uh, lab and data work where we are running some basic tests for comparing between groups. These include the chi-square, uh, two different t-tests, and a one-way ANOVA. So if you would like to follow along, you'll need the lab sheet, uh, which is in the description, or feel free to just watch in, see what we do with these four tests. The materials that I'm working with are this lab sheet. Uh, it would be a good idea to review the Palant SPSS Survival Manual, specifically chapters 16, 17, and 18, as we're working from data files from that source. You can get to the data files themselves from the textbooks companion website, which is available at www.mheducation.co.uk slash data hyphen files. And the two data files you'll need are survey.save and experim.save. So on the website itself, you can scroll down and get the data files. Here's survey.save and a little bit further down is experim.save. And it gives you a little information about the background of those data sets as well. So our task list today is to run a chi-square, some t-tests, and a one-way ANOVA. And the differences between these tests are, even though they all work with categorical variables, it depends on if the outcome is continuous or categorical, and depends on what research question you're asking. In a chi-square, what we're doing is looking at if membership in one category, like let's say if someone is a smoker or not, is more likely to happen for those in a different category, like a gender category. So relationships between is the occurrence of someone being in a particular category dependent on their membership in a different category. For t-tests, we're looking at independent t-tests and paired t-tests. For independent t-tests, we're looking at differences in a continuous outcome due to being in a particular group, an independent group, so you can't be part of both groups in, in an independent t-test. Whereas for a paired t-test, we're looking at two occurrences. Uh, so you have the same participant measured at two different times on a continuous outcome variable. So whenever you're thinking t-tests, think two. It's either two groups or two occurrences, t for two. Once we get over two, we need to go into an ANOVA. And now we're looking at if there are differences in a score, a continuous score, due to being in a particular group, but there's more than two groups. There's three, four, five groups. And for this lab, we're going to conduct these examples of the tests and practice write-ups associated with each type of test. And then after working with the lab video, if you're doing this lab for class, you would also run analyses of your own with the same data set, but now with different variables. And those are mentioned in the lab sheet as well. And then if you are doing this for class, you're going to submit your write-up of your analyses with the SPSS and syntax files, output and syntax files. And so you're saving all of your syntax and output files both for the lab and for your analyses that you conduct after the lab. But it's fine to just do the video and not have to turn anything in if it is not for class. So our first task is going to be the chi-square. And again, the chi-square is used to explore the relationship between two categorical variables. And it looks at what we would expect the distribution to be if there was an equal, not impacted distribution of when people went into one category or another uh, compared to if we think there is a significant unequal 
distribution of when someone was in a category or not dependent on their, cata their other categorical variable. For example, is smoking or non-smoking status unequally distributed due to gender? So would being male or female mean that someone is more or less likely to be a smoker? Uh, so we would expect an equal distribution between smokers and non-smokers uh, per gender if gender has nothing to do with it. But if there is an unequal distribution, it says that there might be some uh, factor going on there that being a specific gender makes you more likely to be a smoker or non-smoker. So let's check this out. We're going to start by opening the survey.save um, data file in SPSS, which has all of these variables, ID, sex, which is the gender variable, males and females, uh, and also smoke if someone is smoker status. And to get to cross tabs to get our chi-square test, we're going to go to Analyze, Descriptive Statistics, Cross Tabs. Once here to the Cross Tabs dialog box, place sex variable in the rows and smoke in the columns. And I'm just following along with the lab sheet. So that's available linked in your description of the video and I'm just following along the steps right there. In the statistics box, we're going to select the chi-square test and also the effect sizes for phi and Kramer's V. Continue. In the cells area, we want both the observed and the expected counts. And then in the percentages, we want the row percentages. And continue. And now we're ready to paste and run this syntax, run the code from syntax. Let's take a look at what we have here. So we've activated the data set We've requested a cross tabs of sex by smoke and all of the different uh, requests that we put in through those dialog boxes. So I'm going to run this. And now we have our output. First, we're going to look at this cross tabulation table. Here we can see on the males and the females how many were smokers and how many were non-smokers. So we have a total of 184 males, 33 of them were smokers, and 151 were non-smokers. Now, if the distribution had been pretty equal across the smokers and non-smokers, given how many people there are, we would expect 35, 36, 36 males to be smokers and 148 males to be non-smokers. So there is a little bit of difference between how many uh, non-smokers and how many we would have expected with how many males are in the data set. And then the percent of smokers that are male the percent of male who are smokers is about 18%, 17.9, whereas the percent of males who are non-smokers is 82.1%. Now we can get the same information for females. We have 52 smoking females in the data set and 200 non-smoking females in the data set. And this is a little different than what was expected and percent of females who smoke, 20.6%, and percent of females who don't smoke, 794 
Now what uh, the chi-square or what the cross tabs is looking at are these percentages, 82 and 79, 82% non-smokers for males, 79.4% non-smokers for female. Is this distribution difference a significant difference due to gender, right? And also the 17.9 and the 20.6 for smokers. And our next table, the chi-square test table, is what we check out to see if those differences, if that distribution is not equally distributed across the ratios of male and female. And a little bit of a note here where because we have a small table, a two by two, so you can be smoker or not, it can be male or female, so a two by two table, we are using the line that's continuity correction. And you can find out more about that in the Palant SPSS Survival Guide, but you'll find that it tells you here in the note of the table that it only computes the continuity correction. It's also called a Yates correction when you have a small two by two table. And that gives us the chi-square value of 0.337 with the significance value of 0.562. Now, if we had a bigger table, like a three by two, or let's say it was smoker and non-smoker by um, male, female, and non-conforming, then we would not use the continuity correction row. We would skip back up and use the Pearson chi-square test. So that would be the chi-square value, and that would be the significance. So a significant chi-square test would indicate unequal distribution of the um, across these categories. Is this chi-square significant or not? So here's our significance column. And remember, a significant test is one with a p-value of less than 0 0.05. So if our significance values are less than 0 0.05, then we have a significant test. And a significant chi-squared test is going to indicate a violation of equal distribution. What we have here is no, no significant test here. So our continuity correction, our chi-square with the correction, is not significant. Therefore, the distribution across those categories is not considered unequal. It is just fine. It's a good normal distribution between those uh, categories of male, female, and smoking. Okay, and then our effect size for a chi-square is going to be either a phi coefficient or a Kramer's V. And this goes back to the size of the table again. When we have just a small two by two table, you're going to use the phi coefficient to indicate the effect size. And if it's a larger table, like a two by three or a three by three or anything larger than a two by two, you'll use the Kramer's V effect size to tell your reader about the impact of that uh, test. And then in your write-up or in your lab, we have an example of what a results write-up might look like. A chi-square test for independence was conducted to identify potential relationship between smoker status and gender. Results indicated no significant association. Why is that? Because the chi-square was not significant. Therefore, there wasn't an unequal distribution there. Smoking status was not unequally distributed between male and female participants. So trying out the chi-square test yourself, conduct, conduct one with the same data set, but now find out if there's a relationship between smoking status and having a child at home. So both of, it's gonna be another small table, so a two by two, child at home or not, 
and smoking or non-smoking. Be sure to run the analysis from syntax, interpret the output and write up your results paragraph just like that, and save your output and syntax files for the test if you're doing it for submission. Next, we're going to try out the independent and paired t-tests. Again, the independent samples t-test is for looking at differences in an outcome due to being in one or another group. So two groups and independent because participants could only be in one or the other. Uh, and the outcome has to be a continuous outcome. So it would be like, is there a significant difference in self-esteem scores on a continuous scale between men and women? So between gender orientations in two levels. Um, another thing to consider for t-tests is you would want to have at least 30 participants in each group with approximately equal variation in the outcome between those groups. Now, what does that mean? That variation in average self-esteem should be about the same for the males and for the females. If you have a lot of variation for the males, but only very little variation in the females on those self-esteem scores, then the test is gonna have a hard time estimating if the differences were significant or not. So for this, we'll go back to SBSS and we'll go to Analyze, Compare Means, and Independent Samples T-Test. From here, we want our outcome variable of self-esteem right there in the test variables box. The grouping variable, sex, is going to go into the grouping variable field. Now notice we have this question mark situation. For this, we need to tell SPSS what, what male and female are coded as. And we can find out if you do a right click on the grouping variable, you get this shortcut menu that says variable information. Here you can see that males are coded as one and females are coded as two. So knowing that, we can go define the groups and have it as one and two, knowing that those are the two groups being compared. Do leave your estimate uh, effect sizes on. And we're going to paste and then run this from syntax. Looking at the syntax, we have t-test groups, sex in groups one and two. The dependent variable, the continuous dependent variable is total self-esteem. Uh, display the effect size and the confidence interval is set to 0.95 or p less than 0 0.05. Running this, we have a bunch of tables. In the group statistics box is where you find the how many and the average for each of those groups. So we had 184 males and their average score on total self-esteem was 34.02. Whereas for the females, there was 252 of them, and their average score on total self-esteem was 33.17. So we see they're different, but the t-test is what tells us if the difference was significant or not. But you do need this information, the mean and standard deviation, for both groups to be able to write up the results of this test and you get that from your group statistics box. Moving down, we have this very wide table, independent samples t-test. And there's a couple of things to look at here. First, remember how I said we want to make sure that the variation in the males is similar to the variation in the females? 
Well, we, there's a test for that. It's called Levine's Test for Equality of Variances. So this first couple of uh, columns under Levine's Test for Equality of Variances tells us about this test for violating homogeneity or similar variation between those two groups. Right here, we look at the results of the Levine's test. And we'll, if this is a significant test, it means that there's a violation of homogeneity. In those cases, we want to move to the second line, the second row here, where it says equal variances cannot be assumed and get our t-test information from the second line. However, if Levine's test is not significant, that would mean that we did not violate or the data did not violate um, the test of homogeneity. And in that case, we would assume variances are equal and we would use the top row for our t-test information. So this significance value right here tells us which row of information we're going to use for writing up the t-test. So which row do we want? Here, Levine's test was not significant because 0 0.062 is greater than 0 0.05. Because of that, we're going to assume equal variances and take our information from the top row. Similarly, when we're looking at the effect sizes for the t-test, normally we're going to use Cohen's d. And here's our point estimate for Cohen's d telling us the magnitude of the differences for the t-test. If we had violated the homogeneity assumption and we had used the second row in the independent samples test, we would also make a correction here for the effect size, and we would use hedges correction. Now you can see that for this example, the point estimate for Cohen's d is the same as the point estimate for hedges. No problem, it's because that equal variances were assumed anyway. Okay, on our lab sheet, we have an example of what this would look like. Now, whenever you're doing write-ups of an analysis, there's some things that are going to be common or consistent in every write-up. You're always going to have each analysis in its own paragraph. Always let your reader know what statistical test was being conducted and what variables were involved in that test. Then you're going to provide the results of the test in a stats line that typically gives the test name, the degrees of freedom, the estimate of the test, the significance value, and the effect size or confidence interval. And then you want to close that paragraph with a statement just in words, not with a lot of math and stats, but just state plainly what was found. For example, an independent samples t-test was conducted to compare the self-esteem scores between males and females. While males had a slightly higher average self-esteem score, this difference was not significant. And there's our stats line right there. We know what kind of test, the degrees of freedom, the test estimate, the significance value, and the effect size Cohen's d. Our interpretive sentence, in other words, there were no significant nor practical differences in self-esteem between males and females. Now, if you're doing this for class, you're going to run another independent samples t-test for differences in self-esteem between groups having a dependent child at home and those not having a dependent child at home. And this is a variable in the data set as well. Again, you're running the analysis from syntax interpret and write up the results, and save your output and syntax files to include in your submission. Okay, next 
we're going to move to the paired samples t-test. And again, this one is run when you have one group of people, one, one sample, but you are having two observations. You're collecting data twice on the one participant. Would be like a pretest, post-test situation. An example research question would be, is there a significant change in participants' fear of statistics test scores following their participation in an intervention? So this is a typical question for looking at an intervention, a training, a treatment program, anything like this where you get a baseline measurement at the beginning before the treatment and you're getting another measurement post-treatment to see was there a significant change in the outcome between the first time you measured it and the second time you measured it. And for this, we're going to use the other data file from Palat called experim.save. Notice when this opens up, it's calling it dataset2. And that's because now I have two data sets open in SPSS and it's keeping track of them. So in this data set, Notice how we have fear of statistics one. Let's go ahead and make that wider. And we have fear of statistics at time two. That's what you need for a paired samples t-test is a measurement that's been conducted twice that you have scores at two time points. So for this, we're going to go back to Analyze and Compare Means, and now go to Paired Samples T-Test. For our pair, we want Fear of Statistics at Time 1 and Fear of Statistics at Time 2. And we don't need any other things other than making sure your estimate effect sizes is still checked. So pasting, and then we'll look at what the syntax has for us. Notice that in my syntax, I can see that we have activated data set two because now we have the second data set open. T-test pairs, so calling for the paired t-test Fear of Statistics 1, Fear of Statistics 2, display the effect size and the confidence interval at 95% and we're ready to run this one. So more tables. Again, the we get kind of descriptives at the beginning. Our paired sample statistics tells us what the average score was at time one and the average score at time two. Average score in what? The fear of statistics, which is a continuous outcome measure. We also have the standard deviation and that there were 30 participants. Now these are the same 30, remember, because in a paired t-test, we're measuring the same participant twice. Going down to our output here, our paired samples test, is where we get the t-test estimate itself that we need for that stats line. Here's our t-test estimate, the degrees of freedom, the significance value, and then the effect size of Cohen's D. Now you're going to use this point estimate, the 0.985 here. Uh, standardizer, we're not using that. So Cohen's D, 0.985. Now, how do we use the effect size to help convey to the reader the magnitude of that effect? Well, in your lab sheet, I'm gonna back up a couple pages here to this blue block on page four. Some general guidelines for effect sizes. If your effect size is the phi coefficient, 
small, medium, and large would be 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and 0.5 respectively. If you are using ETA squared, you have your small, medium, and large effect sizes listed on the second row. And then Cohen's D, small would be 0.2, medium 0.5, and 8 point, 0.8 is large. So how do we work that into the conversation? Let's look at the write-up here. It's independent, paired samples. A paired samples t-test was conducted to evaluate the differences of students' fear of statistics scores from before an intervention compared to after the event intervention. Results found a significant decrease in uh, fear of statistics scores, and there's the t-test. Specifically, the large effect size indicated a significant impact of the intervention on students' attitudes regarding statistics. So we said that the Cohen's D in the output, 0.985 rounds to 0.99, and in our cutoffs on page 4, 0.8 is considered large for Cohen's D, and we have 0.99, that's very large. So we can just tell the reader that the effect size was large because it's in that area. Is the test significant? Yes, because the significance value was less than 0 0.05 right there. Okay, and if you are doing this for class and trying it out yourself, you're going to run a paired samples t-test and now you're looking at if there's differences in confidence uh, before and after the intervention. So confidence at time one and confidence at time two. Again, run the analysis from syntax, keep your output in your syntax files, and write up the results in a paragraph similar to this. Okay, now we're moving on to the one-way ANOVA. And an ANOVA is used when we have more than two conditions or more than two observations. So we're going to look at a one-way ANOVA where we have more than two conditions. Um, we still have to have a continuous dependent variable but it's when we have groups that are more than just two. An example would be, is there a difference in optimism scores for younger aged, middle aged, and older aged participants? In other words, if I took ages of my sample of the participants and I grouped them into three separate groups, they're going to be independent groups because you can't be young aged and middle aged at the same time. So these are three groups that are independent of each other. The one-way ANOVA will test the if differences between the groups exist. Differences in what? Whatever that continuous dependent variable is. So we're going to look at optimism and we're saying are there differences in optimism for these three independent groups. So for this, we're going to go back to our first data set, the survey.c, so data set one. Go to analyze, compare means, and one way ANOVA. And here we want our dependent variable of total optimism in the dependent list. There it is. And our factor is going to be age grouped by three. We want to check the box to estimate effect size. And then we're going to add some more things on here. In the options area, we want 
descriptives. We want the homogeneity of variance test. And go ahead and choose the Brown Forsyth and the Welch test as well. We're going to hit continue here to go back to the main dialog. And then in post hoc, we're going to select the Tukey test. Now this is because a one-way ANOVA is only going to tell us if significant differences exist, but it's not going to tell us where those differences exist. It's the post hoc test, and we're choosing the two key post hoc comparison to identify exactly between which groups the significant differences may exist. Now, typically, you run the one way ANOVA first and don't worry about post hoc tests. And once that comes back significant, then you run it again with the post hoc test involved. But we're just adding it in for the sake of time. I'll hit continue here, and then we will paste and check out our syntax. Notice that we have reactivated dataset one to move back to survey.save. We're asking for a one-way ANOVA, which is total optimism by age group three. We want the overall effect size and some extra statistics we we requested and the rest of the stuff as usual that it's going to skip things that are missing it's going to put the confidence interval level at 95 percent and that we want a post hoc test uh, using tukey selecting all of this we're ready to run and check out our output The first thing we have here is our descriptives table. And we see our three groups, the younger aged, the middle aged, and the older aged. We see how many people, how many participants were in each of these groups. And their average, what? Their average score on the dependent variable of total optimism. So the mean and standard deviation for total optimism in each of these groups. And we see that optimism was the highest in the older aged group. It was in the middle for the middle aged group and it was lowest for the youngest group, the younger aged group. And before we go on to check out the test results for the ANOVA, we want to consider this um, assumption of homogeneity of variance. And to do that, we have the table that looks at Levine statistic, which tells us if there's a violation in homogeneity. Here, we're going to look at the significance value. We're taking that top row where it says based on mean and seeing is the Levine test significant or not. If Levine's test is significant, and then we want to use a more conservative ANOVA test. Uh, the Brown uh, Forsyth or the Welch's test. And if the Levine statistic is not significant, then we're fine. We have not, the data have not violated homogeneity and we can use the regular ANOVA table. So the first question is, is this test significant or not? Looks like it's not significant because the p-value is not less than 0 0.05. Therefore, we can use the regular ANOVA table to get our statistics for the F-test. The F-test statistic itself, the degrees of freedom, the significance value of the F-test, all of these would go into the write-up. And then for the effect size, we come down to the table ANOVA effect sizes and we see this one called eta squared, the point estimate of 0 0.021. <clears throat> now, if we did have a significant Levine's test, we would be getting our test results from the robust test of equality of means here, the last one. And this would be our F test statistic 
the degrees of freedom and the significance and we would use those instead of the regular ANOVA table if the Levine's test had been significant. So it depends. However, we do have a significant F test, right? And that means we can look at the post hoc Tukey test to identify exactly between which groups did this significant difference occur at. So we scroll down to our post hoc tests, multiple comparisons, and the easiest way to read this is to go down the significance column and look for the comparisons that were less than 0 0.05. So we have this 007, and this pertains to the older group compared to the younger group. So this first couple of rows these first two pertain to the younger group compared to the middle aged and compared to the older aged, but the only one that's significant is the comparison between the younger group and the older group right there. And then if you look down the table, you see that we also have a 007 in the next to last row, which is a significant p-value. And this is between, again, the younger group to the older group. So these last two rows are all about the older aged group compared to the younger group and the older aged group compared to the middle aged group. And the only one that's significant is the, the two ends, the younger age compared to the older age. Here for the middle aged group, both of these p-values are not significant. So there is no significant difference in optimism when we're comparing the middle-aged group to the younger group, nor when we're comparing the middle-aged group to the older group. So what would this write-up look like then? Again, we're going to let the reader know what type of test was conducted and to let the reader know what variables were involved in this test. Here we let the reader know what the different groups were and the results of the test. There was a st statistically significant difference in optimism scores. There's our F telling the reader that this is an F test, the degrees of freedom, the estimate of the F-test, the significance value, and the effect size. We used eta squared at 0 0.02, and that's right up here, eta squared of 0 0.02. How big is 0 0.02? We can go back to our guidelines. Eta at 0 0.02 is pretty small. It says 2% of the variation in the outcome was due to being these differences between groups. Okay. So while achieving statistical significance, the effect was very small. Post hoc comparisons were conducted using the Tukey test. So when you do have a significant F test on your ANOVA, you need to go ahead and do the post hoc comparisons and report where the differences actually occurred so that the reader is informed. This indicated the mean scores for optimism of the younger group were significantly lower than scores for the older group. Optimism scores for the middle age group did not differ significantly from either younger nor older age groups. Okay, so if you're doing this for class, you want to go ahead and run your own one-way ANOVA to determine if there are significant differences now in self-esteem instead of optimism in those same three age groups, the younger, the middle, and the older aged. Again, if your F-test is not significant, you just report the ANOVA. But if the F-test is significant, you also report those differences and exactly where they're happening using that two key post hoc test. Um, 
run the analysis from syntax, interpret the output, and write up your results, and make sure to save your output and syntax files for your work. So again, if this is for grad RMD class, you want to go ahead and save all of your output and your syntax files for your work with the lab and your extra analyses for each of these as well. Okay, that's it. Have fun with basic tests to compare between groups.